Why, hello, everybody. Welcome to another Cloud Native Live episode from Cloud Native TV. Uh, my name is Mario Loria. I'm a CNCF ambassador. Uh, I've been an ambassador for a few years. Uh, you might have noticed me in the community or tweeting weird memes uh, around Kubernetes and cloud infrastructure. Um, I really enjoy uh, this space, and I'm so happy today to have Lee Briggs from Pulumi, who's going to be talking about uh, some exciting things. I don't want to give too much away, um, but really quickly, uh, Pulumi is an application for building, deploying, and managing infrastructure. I've been following them since day one. Um, they've kind of become this alternative to what it looks like of creating uh, or to create infrastructure from scratch and giving you more options um, in terms of building that infrastructure, of course, and managing it, right? Very similar to Terraform in some ways, but very different in some really, really nice ways as well. Um, check them out at pulumi.com. Um, and I think one of the goals for me this session is to help you understand the, the concepts and the methodologies uh, that Lee, Lee is talking about. So please ask as many questions as you can in whichever platform you're currently using right now. Um, and I will help to facilitate, make sure that uh, myself and Lee get to those questions to make sure you're getting the, the best information um, and getting the, the correct answers to understand and one up your skills. So um, I'm really excited. Uh, Lee has experience at Aptio and, and Yelp. Uh, he is a dev advocate at the Pulumi Corporation uh, right now, and I, I'm pretty sure I've heard of him in a, a few other circles as well. I, I think he's he's a bigger deal than he's going to let on uh, for sure. But um, so <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm talking him up a little bit, but I'll let him uh, prove it to you. So, um, Lee, take it away. Uh, thank you so much. And everybody, please ask many questions. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mario. I really appreciate the kind words. I would not necessarily describe myself as a as a big deal, um, but you know, I I have been active in the cloud native community for for a long time now, and uh, I think a lot of people know me for a uh, expletive written uh, blog post a little while ago about templating YAML, uh, which you can see on my blog, uh, leebriggs.co.uk. So um, I'm actually here to talk about something similar to that. Um, one of the things that um, I have really kind of leaned into in the last few years, especially as cloud native technologies have taken off, is the idea that user interfaces are super important. And while a lot of these cloud native technologies are extremely empowering, um, they are often, in my experience, not always the most user friendly because they are building blocks, because you are supposed to layer your, you know, your beautiful uh, experience on top of them. So the title of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, humanizing your cloud native platform. I'm going to whiz through some slides and then I'm going to do a demonstration. Uh, and then we should hopefully have some time for some questions at the end, depending on how much I ramble away. But before I do that, let me first just introduce myself. Uh, I work at Pulumi. Um, I've had several roles at Pulumi. I like to change jobs every six months and I like working at Pulumi. So I just changed my title now. Um, and I occasionally blog about random things I uh, post on Twitter um, and it's usually uh, related to technology and um, I have a github which is full of terrible code um, I'm originally from the UK um, as you can probably tell by the accent um, and so uh, it's really pained me to have Americanized spelling in a lot of these slides so for example humanizing with a Z is not my uh, my preferred way of spelling it but just because I live in the United States now I have kind of leaned into it so what I'm going to be doing is talking a little bit about platforms. Um, platform is such an overloaded term, especially in the cloud native community. It's thrown around all over the place. Um, so before I actually talk about platforms, I'm going to give my definition of a platform in this particular context. So what I'm talking about here is the automated, opinionated, batteries included mechanism that allows you to deliver infrastructure and applications. So if you think about cloud native technologies, you think about things like Prometheus, you think about uh, open tracing, you think about Kubernetes, and all of the things that kind of wrap up in that cloud native software. To me, all of those things are, um, you know, building blocks to build a platform. And certainly I, before I worked at Pulumi, built an, an actual platform with uh, some wonderful colleagues for uh, my, my old employer that incorporated all of these different things um, into a mechanism for our software engineers to deliver applications really like really seamlessly. Um, and I learned a lot during the experience of building a platform. Uh, and a lot of the things that I learned actually um, looked like, um, you know, a lot of those things that I learned actually started to, to become apparent as I joined Pulumi. 
Um, before I actually talk a little bit about um, the humanizing part of this, um, I want to talk a little bit about like the platform adoption. This is from the 2020 State of DevOps report. Um, and I saw this uh, last year and thought, OK, I, I thought we were all crazy for building these complex platforms. But it looks like a lot of people, certainly in the cloud native community, are having similar ideas, which is we're going to build this mechanism to deliver software and infrastructure in a way that allows our users to not really have to think about it. Um, and I think this is really kind of like the uptake in these different platform building mechanisms are really, uh, really starting to, to, to show through, um, especially when you start to think about how Kubernetes and, and, and other related software really makes this easier for you within your organization. Why might you do this? Um, again, we've talked about streamlining application and infrastructure delivery. But for me, it's about empowering developers. Your software developers, if you're on the cloud native side of things and you're more of an infrastructure person like myself, your job is to help your developers deliver software and deliver features to your users as fast as possible so that you can increase the business value that they experience by using your application. And we like to at Pulumi talk about this being a competitive advantage, right? Like you, if you can get your features in the hand of your users as fast as possible, your users will love your application. Because let's face it, we all love shiny new things um, and we all love to kind of experience new features um, and being able to abstract a lot of that complexity away is really the bread and butter of what a platform can do for you and is why you might experience uh, might might think about building one so let's talk a little bit about what automation means in the context of a platform so um, I'm going to have multiple XKCD comics in here because I really think that they capture uh, what it really means to actually work in technology. Um, but ultimately, like really, the, the, the point of automation is to make sure that you get more free time back. Often, in, uh, in certainly in the cloud native experience, I have found that this it looks a little bit like the second of these boxes in which you start to build a cloud native platform, you, input, you incorporate Kubernetes and Prometheus and all these different things into your environment. And then what actually ends up happening is you spend most of your time managing that platform and managing that automation to make sure it works correctly. And what I personally experienced, and this may not be the experience of everybody watching today, but I personally experienced was that that ongoing development meant that I really didn't think about what the experience of people consuming that platform had. I didn't think about how they enjoyed using that platform. Sure, it was easier than it was before when they had to do a bunch of manual deployment processes or a manual bunch of manual release processes, but the ongoing development and upkeep of keep of a platform can really mean that you end up like not focusing on what the user experience is. And ultimately, if you're building a platform, the user experience should be one of the most important considerations because you're really trying to make your people's lives easier. So here are some, uh, I, I, one of my colleagues, Paul, asked me, is this a quote or a statement? I'm like, it's a statement, but I want to try and make it a quote. A good infrastructure platform should allow you to continuously deliver your applications and continuous delivery and platforms are inextricably linked. If you think about continuous delivery, if you've heard that phrase, a platform is really helping you to like build a, a pipeline for, to continuously deliver, deliver your applications. And as I already mentioned, being able to continuously deliver your applications means that your users get features and your uh, the people that you actually are trying to sell your business to will uh, be ultimately be happier. Um, and th this is just a slide from a talk that I watched by Charity Majors. I'm sure everybody uh, watching today has at least heard of Charity Majors, um, which I think is, is really, really important to kind of consider um, that shipping is the heartbeat of your company. Um, and actually delivering application features to your users really should be the thing that happens most often. And a platform will help you do that via automation. If you think about what a really good platform would look like, you start the process and at the end of the process, your users have something in their hands that they can use. So that's a little bit about automa automation, but I'm gonna now go on to the discussion about automation accessibility. Um, what does automation look like in the hands of your users and how usable is it? And I already talked a little bit about the idea that I built a platform and I look back on that platform and I'm not always super convinced that it was accessible to use and easy to use for those people. 
Continuous delivery, as we also mentioned, is not only inextricably linked to a platform, but continuous delivery is often paired with continuous integration. And you often see those two acronyms used together, CI and CD. And if you think about how a lot of uh, automation platforms or delivery platforms look, they often start with a Git push. And, uh, you know, it, certainly in the cloud native, um, in the cloud native community, GitOps is becoming a really kind of big deal. This idea that your Git repositories and your source code repositories are the source of truth for your deployments and your pipeline. Um, and my personal perspective on this is that because Git is not always the most user friendly tool, to actually use, um, and again, you, uh, this this XKCD comic really kind of um, makes me, um, you know, look at this and think, Git is not always the most user friendly of these tools. Um, but if Git and your CI pipeline, the question that I ask myself is, is Git and your CI pipeline the most user friendly interface into infrastructure? Like. Is this the way that you could make your um, deployment and uh, delivery processes user friendly? Is this a human way of actually getting applications into your, um, you know, into your users' hands? And is it a user friendly way for people consuming any platform that you build and actually using it and de delivering that, delivering value? Well, here's a couple of pros and cons. I, you know, I could probably um, talk at great length about this. Uh, and I do have a blog post, um, which is very clickbaity titled that I hope to publish by the end of this week. Um, but some considerations that you might think about in terms of um, using um, Git or using your version control as the interface into your actual delivery pipeline. It allows you to see every atomic commit and the history of your actual changes. If you do it per, if you do it correctly, you can make these things re reproducible. And we see things in the cloud native community around building images and building containers, which will really help you, um, you know, ha would really help you make those deployments re reproducible. Um, my personal perspective is that the feedback loop for GitOps and Git delivery pipelines is really not an optimal way to actually deliver software. Like you don't always get the opportunity to push something and then it just shows up um, into your actual uh, into your actual infrastructure. Um, you're often looking at your CI CD pipeline. You're often looking at you know refreshing a page, looking at you know GitLab pipelines and and GitHub Actions pipelines. And I personally have experienced this and found it to just really not be an excellent feedback loop. However, those tools are familiar, and so we gravitate towards them because it makes our lives easier. So now we'll get to the actual point of what I'm trying to say. Maybe there's a different approach to all of these things. And of course, I'm a Pulumi employee, so I am going to talk a little bit about how Pulumi can help here um, with a demo and an example towards the end. Um, but I'm trying to think. I mean, I'm what I'm really trying to do is start to make you think about. In, when you're building delivery pipelines, especially for myself as an infrastructure engineer, the most important part about humanizing these things is to think about what your users want to do. And every single organization is different. Like I, we all love these opinionated platforms, but you have to actually fit them within the context of your, your company's compliance needs, with the context of your company's application and how it's been built. And humanizing these things, the most important thing, and it's a, a term that we throw around all the time when we talk about DevOps, the most important thing to think about is empathy. What do my users want? And it's a really hard, difficult thing in technology because we all have strong opinions and we all have different approaches uh, that we want to kind of incorporate. But if you think about what the people using your platform really want, then you can start to humanize things. So I like to think about building delivery mechanisms using APIs because APIs are interfaces that most software developers, which is what we are at heart, can actually understand and use. They allow you to create flexible mechanisms to actually consume your platform. They create a communication format that is essentially universal. It goes across languages. It goes across programming languages. And 
the final thing is it creates a documentation mechanism that you know can really help people who come along after you to understand why you did something um so everything you know one of the reasons that i think that kubernetes has really exploded in popularity is not only because it's a container orchestration mechanism but because it has a an api that's well documented that's easy to consume and is published you know basically everywhere you might want to use kubernetes so you know you can go and read the api documentation you can go and actually have a look at what the api is doing and get an idea of what's actually happening inside a kubernetes cluster so the final part of this that I want to talk about um, before I stop boring everybody with slides is I want to talk about how you might build on those APIs to make the APIs consumable for your users. And I'm also going to, you know, shamelessly talk about how Polumi can help you with these things. Um, Building on APIs is, is really helpful in the sense that it actually makes you start to think about what mechanism the users of your platform will want to consume those APIs. So of course they can use the raw API, they can go directly to the Kubernetes, um, you know, the Kubernetes uh, API, and they can even, if they really want, they can define the YAML infrastructure or the YAML definition of that API, which is what a lot of users seem to do. But is that the end be all and end all in terms of humanizing your API? Because a lot of times, especially when you're using configuration file formats like YAML, you end up with a lot of repetition um, and you end up with, you know, hundreds of lines of code when often that repetition is not needed. So what I believe is that the right way to build on those APIs and the right way to humanize your platform is to think about what your users want and then abstract that API away into an easy to use mechanism. And there's a few ways that you can do that. And I'm going to show you examples of how you might do that within uh, within the context of Pulumi. So the first way that I think is really undervalued and really not looked at as much as it should be in the cloud native community is that SDKs are your um, software engineers bread and butter. They use them in their application pipelines. They use them when they're building their application. Libraries, NPM modules, NuGet packages, Go modules, Python pip repositories. These are the things that your users of your platform, the, i.e. the software developers delivering value, these are the things that your users are using every single day. And if you can define software FDK, SDKs for your platform and your infrastructure delivery, we have seen at Pulumi that the amount of um, the amount of uh, velocity your users get when they are able to consume those SDKs can often far outweigh the idea that you would say, "Hey, we have this Kubernetes platform. Go and learn this YAML format and start to understand how it works, and then you'll be able to have a really great experience." Building software SDKs and building things in languages that people understand is one of the first steps in my experience of humanizing that platform and making it user friendly for the people who want to consume it. The second thing to think about is that the people who might want to consume your platform, the people who might want to deliver software are not always software engineers or technical users. Um, I've certainly worked in environments where um, less technical users do need to be able to actually deliver features and software. And web portals, if you think about some of the major cloud providers, they all provide web portals. Web portals can be a super, super valuable part of deploying software and infrastructure delivering value. Um, and if you think about some other cloud native technologies like Argo, um, Argo and Argo workflows, they provide these web interfaces that allow you to actually operate on your, on your uh, Kubernetes infrastructure to really help users actually deliver value. And then the final thing is, is that, you know, I'm personally a command line user. Command line interfaces can really help power users feel effective. And command line interfaces don't always need to be the be all and end all, but a command line interface can help those users that are consuming your platform, especially in an automation context. If you can abstract some of the some of the things away, but leave them with uh, command line flags, for example, that can help them understand um, how they can manipulate things and change things. Command line interfaces is another way of humanizing your platforms. Palumi. Palumi 
Um, I'm going to show you a little bit more about Pulumi in a second, but Pulumi is an infrastructure as code platform that allows you to choose one of our supported languages to actually define infrastructure and application delivery pipelines. Uh, we support the Node.js ecosystem. We support Python. We support Go. We support .NET. My favorite language to use of these .NET languages is Visual Basic because, let's be honest, it's been around for you know nearly 20 years at this point, and anything that's been around 20 years must be a good thing. Um, but you can actually choose the languages that you consume your infrastructure in with Pulumi and deliver value to your users using that language. And it also allows you to choose your workflow. We already talked about web services and command line interfaces with the Pulumi Automation API, which we're going to see a little example of in a few seconds. With the Pulumi Automation API, you can actually start to fit your platform and all of the parts of the platform that you've built, you can actually start to fit it into the context of your organization and build your workflow that makes sense for your users. So I've talked a lot. I've talked for... 20 minutes now. And I don't want to keep talking about these slides. What I actually want to do is put my money where my mouth is and show you an example of what this might look like. This is going to be a live demo. If I make mistakes, I'm just going to just figure it out as we go along. Um, so let's uh, let's take a look at um, what this might look like. Mario, I've just been talking for 20 minutes now. I don't know if you want to jump in with any questions before we start looking at how this might look in practice. No, yeah, this is fantastic. And Lee talked about a lot of things there. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple. Um, the state of DevOps report put out by Puppet is a really important thing to keep your eye on. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of good information there in terms of trends and what's going on in terms of these uh, adoption rates and uh, how many teams are realizing value out of the, the kind of landscape out there, right? Um, and then I, the, other, the other thing I wanted to mention is I have really been diving into developer experience over the, the past few years in my own career. So everything Lee is talking about, and it, it might be hard to grasp, it, you know, UX and focusing on, um, you know, my developers and, um, you know, running the platform. Like, what, what does that have to do? Like, I'm an SRE. Like, I just want to make my cloud infrastructure better. Um, but I actually, what ends up happening, and I've been an SRE for uh, a, a while, and I, I know Lee um, obviously has worked in SRE as well. Like you actually become a support person mm -hmm. more so. And I'm not saying this in an, a bad way. I'm saying that you end up finding so much of your work ends up being ad hoc work. And it is work that is the need of a developer who says, I'm just trying to do this. I'm just trying to get my thing deployed. I'm trying to fix some pods. I'm trying to figure out my resource requests. And what ends up happening is they don't really know and they're going to go to you. You're, you're just, you're that kind of dependency and you're really a blocker in the chain. And in that way, they, they look to you. And so that is where the, the stopping comes in and the asking comes in and the having to, to solve these tiny little nuances, right? But what, what Lee's actually saying here is, why don't we solve the underlying problem that the platform and the semantics for how we ship applications, how we manage applications, and the flexibility and the shift left of focusing on the developer and what their workflow is, we can actually solve a lot of those problems and we can make it really self-service, which is what we're looking for. Um, yeah. And we can make it you know, make sense and fit into our policies and fit into our security and fit into what our goals are for our platform, right? And so that ends up turning around and changing the paradigm where SRE actually becomes what SRE is meant to be as people that are automating the toil away, maintaining an amazing platform, and maybe helping even abstract other elements of the, the platform in terms of other realms, uh, you know, security or latency or whatever it might be, right? Um, so I love everything you mentioned, Lee. Uh, everything there is really strong. Um, we had a question on what are the prerequisites? I think you can get into that in the demo a little bit as well. Yeah. You know, what are the prerequisites yeah. to leveraging Pulumi? Um, and I think what we're really starting to see is, is the enablement and like you said, empowerment of developers to do more of this on their own with SDKs, with APIs and with tools like Pulumi. I love Crossplane um, and uh, Backstage from Spotify, Ambassador DCP, like these kind of control plane centric elements where developers don't actually really need to know Kubernetes. And it's all about getting them to know less 
so they can do their jobs faster and actually produce more. Um, so I'll stop talking now. Uh, Lee, yeah, I, I'm really I, excited I, for this. Hopefully the demo works. <laughs> I, 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 I just wanted to just kind of add something as well. Like, and, and I, something that I kind of had, you know, I, I have these, I've had these moments in my career, these kind of epiphany moments where you start to realize that everything you've been doing the last few years is really not the right way. Uh, and I had a conversation with a, with a developer in my old, uh, the old company that I worked at. And I was trying to get them to adopt this infrastructure tool that had a learning curve. And I'd spent like six months, like learning how to use this infrastructure tool. And I was talking to this software developer and I went to them specifically because I knew that the software developer was super smart, super capable. Like they were the person who I would go to get a, get a bunch of answers. And I was like, look, we're going to build this platform and we're going to make it, we're going to build it around this infrastructure tool. And, um, you know, I'd really like you to be an ambassador for the platform and all that kind of stuff. And their response, the software developer's response was like, I, it's really great that you've had six months to learn this tool, but I've also got other things to do, right? Like I've got to deliver features to my users. I've got to actually get things in the hand of people. Um, and I don't really have six months to learn this tool. You know what I mean? And I had realized I had spent six months building something and learning something. And that was my full-time job. But the software developers who actually wanted to use the platform, they were like, I, I don't have time to do any of this. It's really cool. And it's really exciting. But what am I like... I, I don't get to put six months of sprint work to learn this new tool so that I can help people be an ambassador. And it really changed my perspective. It really changed the way I think about things. And I've been thinking about that for two years and it's really culminated in this particular talk because when we talk about humanizing things, you really have to think about what your end users have to do in order to actually consume the platforms you're building with cloud native technology. And I really love like Backstage is a great example what you brought up there, Mario, of a thing that has come up around these different needs, right? Like the consumers of the people who own and manage backstage, they get to actually build something and then the consumers just get a really nice experience. And if you think about where all the really great cloud native technologies are, the ones that give those interfaces that are kind of flexible and buildable are really, really, um, really taking off and really starting to see their usage explode. And again, I think this is one of the reasons why Kubernetes is so popular. I know it's a polarizing <laughs> piece of infrastructure. Like you, you know, every week there's a new Hacker News article that says we don't use Kubernetes and we love it. And I'm like, great. But what about all those people you know, you know, what are they, what are those people that aren't using Kubernetes going to do after this? Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think hopefully the ideas that I'm talking about again along, but let's see it in practice, right? Like, let's have a look what this might actually look like Absolutely. Um, sure. from a user interface perspective. So uh, you probably saw a link on the screen earlier. Um, there's a GitHub repo with some Pulumi code in it um, that I kind of threw together yesterday evening that uses three features of Pulumi that will allow you to really, I think, um, uh, let your users consume things in a, um, you know, in a really nice way. And we can either show it now or show it at the end. Um, but what I'm going to do is quickly, like, um, go through what I've actually built. So let's just switch the screens here. So this uh, is my VS Code window, uh, and what I've done here is build a very, very um, lightweight example of building a software SDK for delivering infrastructure to a platform built on Kubernetes, right? So what I'm going to do is just quickly show you through what this might look like. Um, uh, I've written this in our Go SDK, um, and it, you can probably, if you're a Kubernetes user, or some of this will look very similar. So you have a namespace, you have a Kubernetes deployment, and then you also have a Kubernetes service. And of course, you know, the idea here is to, you know, just suspend your belief for a second um, about what a production ready application might look like. Um, but what we're doing here is, is is using our the Pulumi Go SDK to actually um, like create consumable SDKs in all of Pulumi's other supported languages. Um, and this like this really this this ability to do this is one of the most strong things in terms of humanizing platform uh, accessibility because if you're working in a software engineering environment you probably have a back end language and a front end language it might be the same you might be using node for both um, but i've certainly worked in environments where you know users will use go on the back end and they'll use typescript on the front end or they might use you know you might be a windows shop and be using dot, uh, c sharp and f sharp um, but being able to actually allow your users to consume your infrastructure in software languages that they feel 
familiar with and comfortable with, but not having to make them choose, I think is a really, really strong part of um, you know creating a humanized platform. So as I said, I've created a uh, an example production ready application um, that will uh, that is written in Go, but it compiles into all of Pulumi's supported languages. So you, we have .NET, we have Go, we have Node.js and Python libraries that can be used from this production ready application. And if you think about what this might look like in practice when you as an infrastructure platform owner want to update what a um, what a production ready application looks like perhaps you have decided that uh, that, that three replicas in a uh, you know in a palumi sorry in a kubernetes deployment three replicas is no longer acceptable for production ready and you want it to be five instead um, you know, you can update this, you can version it like software and you can ship it to your users and they just consume it like a normal software library that they're already doing in their uh, software development lifecycle. And again, this is actually creating software development libraries in th in four different ecosystems. So your users no longer have to set, choose to learn a new language or a new configuration file format or a complex DSL that they're only going to use for the deployment mechanism. Um, and they can actually consume it um, in their languages that they're already using in their application lifecycle. So, Lee, you, Lee, I have a question really quick. I, sure. I, I want to I wanna unpack this a little bit. So what you're saying is that we can issue a library, being the SRE team, being the platform team, we can issue a library that has some of these um, kind of expected defaults uh, or best practices that we want for applications being deployed on our platform. And we can write this out. We can obviously have it reviewed by our, our co-members and, and other developers as well. And we can issue it as a library. That's and right. then kind of what you're saying is, you know, that library is a Go library. So anyone writing their, their microservice in Golang can actually pull in that library and now get the best of all worlds, right? They get everything that we intended in terms of, you know, what the platform should look like, what applications should look like running on the platform, right? Um, and they also get a, a little bit of basically automation, if you will, of yeah. the the work has been done for them. There's nothing, they don't have to go dabble in deployment spec YAML, right? They yeah. don't need to write a config map. They don't need to handle secrets maybe. And maybe we get to secrets later, that's a tricky one. but. Um, it, it seems like, you know, it, I guess you're taking some of that extra configuration that we actually end up replicating in so many repos with values files and, and home charts. And when you have microservices and there's 40 of them, you're really just copying the same the same things over and over. It, it sounds like this being issued as a library that maybe you tag. Is this how most teams that you've worked with are, are, are doing this? They, they basically write these libraries in these languages and adapt them into their services. And then they got basically everything they need. Yeah, absolutely. That's you've you basically hit the nail on the head. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to show you is three different ways of consuming this library, right? So, um, the like we talked about, um, you know, different mechanisms of humanizing these libraries. The building right. block of those humanize of that humanization is building these reusable libraries, right? Like you start absolutely. here, you start here with like an, an SDK that other the other users can consume, and then they get to choose. And I think we all love choice. Like uh, choice is one of I think. Choice is one of the foundations of the cloud native uh, foundation, um, but allowing users to be able to choose how they consume these things is really powerful. And I've actually got examples that I'm going to show you of consuming this particular library that I've created in three of our different supported languages. Um, so let's Absolutely. look at the, let's look let's look at the first one, right? And I'm going to start with. Um, a traditional infrastructure as code workflow, right? So this is our this is the TypeScript library, and you can see here it builds an npm package called Palumi Production App, um, and you can see that the actual um, like the actual implementation of all of this Go code is four lines of TypeScript, right? I'm going to specify an image. I'm going to say what image that, what port that image runs on. And then it's going to basically return me a URL from my Minikube cluster, um, which, you know, if you think about the user experience of what that looks like, um, you know, a, for, for a TypeScript developer or a front end engineer, this is just a very standard workflow for them. Like import a package, write a couple lines of code, and I'm going to get an expected end, end point. Um, and so I'm going to deploy the Kuad uh, example app to a Minikube cluster. Um, and let's take a look at what that looks like. And again, I think this is 
for most people doing infrastructure as code uh, or most people in the cloud native community, this is a workflow that they'll feel familiar with. Like you define something and then you run an external command line tool to actually deploy it. It might be kubectl, it might be, you know, any of the other infrastructure as code, um, you know, things that you might be familiar with but this is one example of a workflow it's a little bit more human because instead of having to you know define 200 lines of yaml or figure out how the helm templating system works um instead you're just using native code so it's still a little bit more human but it's not a huge a huge amount different to what your current workflow is so um uh, let's look in my example repo. So examples, no JS and just make sure that I have an index file here. Oh, that type of course. And you can see, I have, uh, a little tiny, uh, Kubernetes cluster, um, locally, just a micro, uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so I want to get my production ready application onto this cluster. So what I would do, let me just bump this up a little bit. Uh, there we go. So what I would do is run Pulumi up. So think about this in terms of ku cuddle apply or something along those lines. Uh, and you can see it's going to deploy my namespace. It's going to deploy my service and it's going to create my deployment. So hit yes, again, very, very familiar, familiar kind of workflow. Um, we talked earlier about feedback loops. I think this feedback loop is really, really good because if you think about how kubectl works, like you just send off an API request and then you have to do a bunch of debugging commands to actually let you know if any of that actually worked or not. Um, but you can see it's created my namespace, my service, and my deployment. Um, and it's just returned me the URL of what my service is running on. Um, and I can actually verify that that is created. You can see I have an example namespace. And in that example namespace, you can see I have my three replicas, right? So um, this, my production ready application has been defined and is running and it allows me to, as an upstream platform owner, it allows me to define those different, um, you know, those different things. Um, and again, like if we imagine what this might look like from a downstream consumer perspective, let's use the example that I uh, mentioned earlier, all of a sudden our infrastructure team have decided that we want to have five replicas as a production ready application. So I'm going to go ahead and update this to five replicas and I'm going to rebuild my library. So we'll just wait for a second and, you know, let you imagine some elevator music right now while we, you know, while we wait for our uh, library to build. Um, <laughs> I could talk a little bit about what this is doing, but it's essentially generating the SDKs for Go, for .NET, for Python. Um, and you can see it's actually creating a bunch of Python packages. It's creating my YAN packages, my NPM packages. Um, oh, okay, Lee, so this, this is like the example of basically us as developers of this library issuing a new version, like a new yes. tag that, that yeah. other developers can then say, oh, there's a new tag. I want to pull that in to my service yeah. and adopt that. And those changes autom inherently just are automatic. Basically. Yeah, exactly. They deploy. Okay. You can actually see the version here. So obviously, if you like, you know, use proper semantic versioning in Node packages or Python or all that kind of stuff, you might update the um, version to, you know, 1.0 or 0.0.2 or something like that. Um, right. You know, we, we, we're essentially just updating. Um, we would release this as a new version. Again, your downstream users would decide when they want to pull this in. So again, it's their choice. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than somebody breaking, um, you know, breaking things in production mm -hmm. or all that kind of stuff. Um, Absolutely. So again, it's just going to generate these things. Um, I think I ran it twice because, uh, uh, you know, um, but oh well. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> so it's generating all of the different packages that we're actually going to consume. Um, and then, uh, again, your downstream users are um, going to be able to um, rerun their application. Um, and because I've automatically yarn linked into, into here, the actual uh, package, what, what would actually happen is your users would take the dependency and do an NPM install in this TypeScript example. But if I rerun my Pulumi up now, we should see that we're getting a difference in our actual infrastructure deployment. So mm -hmm. if I okay. look at the details, my replicas have now gone from three to five. Um, and you, again, your users are able to actually experience this in a more kind of relatable workflow to them. Um, you know, Got it. And even though we're using imperative languages, even though we're actually using, um, you know, Node.js, you'll notice that this is a declarative process. So if I rerun my Pulumi up, it should say there are no changes. 
um, because we've already actually defined our infrastructure. So again, declarative like Kubernetes already is, but using an, an imperative TypeScript language that allows us to actually, um, you know, feel like we're actually using things that we already feel familiar with. So I Got think it. this is, I think this is a super powerful workflow, um, but we didn't just talk about using, uh, you know, TypeScript and all those kind of things. We talked about going an extra step. Um, we talked about actually making, um, you know, making this relatable, not just for our software engineers, but for other users within our organization as well. So the next thing that I want to show you is again, another example of consuming, excuse me, another example of consuming this particular, uh, software library that we've created. Um, and what I've done inside this repository is I have created a power user command line interface using Pulumi's automation API. So um, if you are a Go developer, this will look pretty familiar to you. I'm using uh, the Kingpin CLI library, and you can see I'm importing um, our Go SDK. So again, this is the same um, this is the same library that I'm that I was consuming in my TypeScript earlier, but now it's using the Go SDK. Um, but I'm and I'm creating a command line tool that I could distribute to my users within my audit within my org organization, and they can consume my platform using a command line tool that has again abstracted most of the complexity away, but still allows them to choose the image they want to deploy and the part that they want to choose. So. Uh, a lot of this is kind of, uh, and you'll see when I run the tool, a lot of this is actually just um, uh, a mechanism to make this look pretty fancy. Uh, but most of the actual pr the stuff is actually here. Uh, you can okay. see... Uh, Lee, really quick, I'm, I'm interested. So is this basically us abstracting away Plumi itself a little bit? Where yes. like we're actually optimizing for the UX of how we want our developers to be able to work with... Uh, our, our abstractions. Yes, okay. exactly. So we're not going to have to run Pulumi up on this program because that is going to happen inside our Go binary, right? Okay. So um, this is using Pulumi's automation API. Um, and again, if you if you if I open up the um, examples that I had earlier, uh, the Node.js example, you can see we were creating a production app because that's our import deployment. And in our uh, in our command line interface example. It looks, it's basically the same. We're specifying an right. image, we're specifying a port. Like the actual consumption okay. of this itself is very, very familiar. Um, and it looks very familiar right. over different languages. When I started at Pulumi, I'd never written a single line of TypeScript. Um, I am now, uh, you know, not a good TypeScript developer, but I certainly am way better than I was a year ago. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 this has kind of leveled up my skills. Like this cross compilation capability, and cross compilation is not the right terminology, by the way, but this cross SDK um, f functionality has helped me to understand different languages uh, and helped me to understand. Yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, continue. This is this is sweet. I want to see the CLI in action. So let's so um let's um let's have a look at this. So let's look at the CLI, uh, and I'm actually going to rebuild it. So I'm going to do go build minus o production app. Um, if you are a Go developer, this will look pretty familiar. Uh, and I've just noticed that uh, my um, <laughs> I think my uh, the the tag is actually going to cover up what I'm going to run. So let me very quickly do this um, like that. There we go. Um, yes, that moving it to the right side would be super helpful. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, so uh, I've built my Go binary like so. Uh, and you can see it's called prod app like this. And I can actually look at the help and you'll see that I need to specify a name and I have a deploy command and a destroy command. Um, so let's have a look what our deploy command actually does. So what my required flags are, I need to specify a name for the deployment. I need to specify an image and I need to specify a port that that image runs on. And you can also see because I'm using a command line interface in Go, I can actually, um, you know, set defaults. Um, you know, I can actually specify that port 80 is the default for these different things. So let's run my prod app and I'm going to specify a name of example CLI and then my image. I'm just going to run the Nginx image for this particular example, like so. Um, and again, if you think about if you're a CLI power user, um, you know what image you want to run. Um, you know what, um, 
you know, you know what, you want to call the thing that you're going to deploy. So let's run this. Um, uh, unknown long flag image. Excellent. Well, you know, um, oh, I haven't actually specified a command. That will help, won't it? Um, so I actually need to run the deploy command. Um, <laughs> that would probably help. So I'm going to run deploy um, and the name and the image, like so. And I've built this, this uh, and I, I'm, I'm saying I'm, but my actual wonderfully talented colleague, Kamal Ali, uh, actually built this, this a beautiful UI. Um, and it's going to deploy my Kubernetes deployment, my Kubernetes service, and my production, uh, my actual deployment, and the Pulumi stack. Um, and it's going to actually do all of the Pulumi stuff that we did in our Pulumi up. Um, and I haven't invoked Pulumi at all. Um, I haven't used the Pulumi CLI in any way at all. Um, and I can verify again that this is actually deployed by getting my namespaces. And you can see uh, I have this production app namespace that it's actually going to create. Uh, CTL get PO minus N production app. And here's my five replicas. So I updated my library earlier. I rebuilt my, um, you know, I rebuilt my uh, command line tool with the new dependencies that I have, and I've been able to deploy my infrastructure in a way that my my organization's command line users feel comfortable with and feel familiar with. And if you wanted, you can stick this directly in your CI pipeline, right? Like you can abstract all of this away in your CI pipeline. Um, without actually having to worry about um, all of the different steps and all that kind of stuff, your entire infrastructure portal has been bundled into a command line interface that you can just throw into a CI pipeline. This is literally amazing. So I actually have a use case for this in my own organization. We're building a singular tool. Uh, that tool we're building to solve for local, uh, local development and eventually remote development ephemeral environments, right? And Plumi here can provide so much, right? Like we can build Plumi into that tool. We don't have to have people learn Plumi yeah. as well and Plumi up, right? It just, everything's kind of built in and integrated, right? So yeah, I absolutely. think like this is one of those things where if you're getting to the size and you're saying, okay, we need to abstract away this complexity, provide a single kind of streamlined path to do these things, right? And and something that encapsulates all of the, the things we care about, whether it's like security, whether it's, um, linting, whether it's like certain configurations for our monolith that gets deployed, right? And that's all into one tool that you you maintain and manage. And then you just slipstream, you know, Pulumi um, configuration and your, your kind of de facto library for what deployments and, and managing those apps looks like. Like, this is incredibly powerful. I think, you know, if you're a startup, you're probably not necessarily using this, depending on, on what you're doing, maybe. Ahead, I mean, I, yeah, no, I, 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 I 100% agree. Like, we, we're not, we're okay. not necessarily talking about, hey, you know, I'm just trying to get off the ground. Um, you know, I'm just right. trying to uh, get my my application from A to B. This is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of work in those situations. But in those larger mm -hmm. organizations where you know you've already built a working platform, and what you're now thinking mm -hmm. about is how this looks for your users, this is such a powerful way to do things. Um, you know. Um, and then there's one final thing that I want to show you, and I'm just conscious of time. Um, well, we talked about, I mean, command line interfaces and software SDKs are one mechanism for actually de delivering infrastructure. Um, but we also talked about those users who are very used to web applications and consoles. Um, so again, building off the, um, off the work that a very, very talented colleague of mine called Kamal Ali did, and I'm just going to extend this so I can switch screens. Um, I've also embedded this into a Python Flask web application. So if we take a look in our, um, in our source code here, um, again, we're going to consume our production application inside a web application. Um, and I'm going to import my deployment and deployment args. And again, remember, I've only written this code in one language, right? Like I haven't written, I haven't had to maintain four different languages here. I've written it in one languages and it's generated SDKs for me in four different languages. Um, I can now create a very simple Flask web application that does a Pulumi deployment within the web application itself. And there's considerations here, for example, like timeouts, like web timeouts and all that kind of stuff. Like infrastructure provisioning can take a little, a little while sometimes. So like um, building this into web applications has different considerations that you might want to think about retries and all that kind of stuff. But 
Um, and actually, retries is not a great example, but you may want to do things like dispatch to a worker, for example, like a Kubernetes pod is one thing that I've seen a pattern of where a web application will dispatch a Kubernetes pod, which runs Pulumi. Um, but again, like the Pulumi, um, like the actual Pulumi is three lines of Python, right? Um, it's just a web application um, that is going to, again, deploy to our Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to start this little Python web server, and you can see you got a sneak peek there uh, that I already started earlier to make sure it works. Um, so it's starting a Python web application. And let me just refresh this to make sure it works. So we have no active deployments, right? Um, so I can specify a name. Uh, let's call it Web App Example. Uh, and again, I'm going to deploy the Docker um, Docker image of Nginx Latest. If I click Create and move back to my um, CLI, you can see again it's it's actually running Pulumi in the background. Like this Python SDK is actually provisioning things. And again, we've got our five pods available here. It's actually provisioning things into our Kubernetes cluster via the web application. And you can actually see that. And if you if you're a way more talented front end engineer than I am, you could actually you know perhaps stream this in your web application so that your non technical users can get an example of what this looks like. And if I go back to my uh, web platform thing. I now have my web app example has been deployed. Um, and, you know, I can, uh, if I had the networking set up for Minikube correctly, I could actually open this page and go directly to my Nginx, um, you know, my Nginx example. Um, so the, these, these are different ways that you can actually build these reusable libraries, but then you can actually, the, due to the flexibility that we provide in the Pulumi Cloud Engineering Platform, this allows you to choose and decide what ways your users will be able to, um, you know, what way your users will be able to consume it. And I'll also just have to caveat, I think I mentioned this before, I don't particularly consider myself a talented software engineer. Um, I am um, from an infrastructure background, right? I um, I learned HTL, I wrote bash scripts, I wrote, um, you know, I wrote, um, you know, YAML configuration files for years and years and years. And I threw this together last night in a couple of hours. Um, so if you are an actual talented software engineer and you're actually capable of doing these things, imagine the kind of things that you could build that your users will be able to actually consume and use. Um, you know, it's it's the, the the due to the flexibility, the possibilities really are endless. I'm glad you said that because I am a terrible programmer. I am acknowledging that here in public. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't even know what I'm doing most of the time. Um, and this looks simple enough to me, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm good at reviewing code and, and looking for things that don't make sense because I try to like take and understand the logic and, and piece it out, right? Um, so I love how simple this has gotten. And this is, this is amazing. This is, again, is the, we want to provide a platform to our users and we, we can do it either via you know the web, we can do it via a CLI or a simple library, right? And everyone works on a different kind of plane and, yeah. and wants the, the flexibility. So I love the flexibility. I, I, are, are these new, is this new to Plumi or is it, is it just gotten easier? Um, I think both. Uh, the um, the okay. automation API has been around now for a year, and honestly, like if I could tell you some of the incredible things that people have built with the automation API, it just it blows me away all the time. Mm -hmm. Like what people like, you know, one of the reasons I like to show this this web platform type example is because we have users that are actively building not just internal web platforms, but actual provisioning tools for external users that heavily leverage Pulumi's automation API to provision infrastructure. Um, you know, it's it's such a powerful mechanism. It's been around about a year now. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. and again, I've, I've got to give shout outs to my colleague, uh, Kamal, who has really put in lots of effort and another colleague of mine, Evan, um, who has really just kind of completely kind of seen what the potential and possibility of the automation API is and really created this incredible, um, flexible tool. The multi-language part that I've showed you where you can write a component that you can reuse in one language and it generates SDKs in all four available languages. That's a new feature that we announced earlier this year. Um, and if you think about like the maintenance burden that people had that were creating these reusable components before this, uh, if they wanted to support all Pulumi users, they had to maintain languages and, you know, maintain libraries in four different languages. And the maintenance burden was just crazy. 
Um, mm, you know, we, right. we um, what we are planning on doing, we're working on right now, is we're actually uh, working on creating. Um, and I, I don't have a, an end uh, date for this, but it is on the. It's in in progress right now. Is we're building a registry that will allow you to share these components and build them and actually distribute them to other users as well. So right now, you can see this is all in a Git repository um, that I, um, you know, that I kind of maintain. And you can take a look at this. Um, like I would encourage you to go and have a look uh, and i'm just going to bring up the page if you um i'm just going to bring it up here uh, my fingers have just completely stopped typing um but i'm gonna just type it in here so this is the the repository is available if you want to take a look at it uh you can um you know and you can see i was working on this an hour ago um and it give it should give you examples of how to build and look at this thing but if you want to see what this looks like um it's all in here so please don't hesitate and you can also reach out to me on twitter at brigzel uh, and i'm quite happy to kind of walk you through some of these examples as well um but we are going to as i mentioned be creating a registry that will allow you to build these components which we're looking at in here inside our uh, um, inside out this provider package. So this production app, these components will be reusable and resharable. Um, and so if you think if you're a Helm chart maintainer, if you're a um, module maintainer, um, you know, the possibility for you to be able to um, write these kind of things and reach, you know, think about how large the JavaScript community is. You're basically reaching every JavaScript engineer there is. Um, and you can do that relatively easily with these kind of multi-language components. This is, uh, this is amazing. This is the next iteration of Pulumi, and this is what makes it easier, what makes it more composable, repeatable, shareable, portable, um, all of those fundamentals, all of those principles that we are trying to build uh, modern platforms on, I think, right? And I think this is amazing. Focus on services, focus on developers. Um, it's so great to see this. I really wish now that I would have uh, been looking at Plumi at least some point in the past few months uh, and and playing around with it. I definitely will be uh, maybe even this weekend. Uh, this is this is exciting stuff, Lee. What you know, you mentioned the roadmap a little bit. What is some of the the key things that you're seeing the teams that are using Plumi right now? What are they looking at and asking for in terms of like uh, more maybe more power uh, in control? over what is possible, more flexibility in dealing with monoliths or, or enterprise applications and bringing those into the, the mold of Kubernetes land. What, what is kind of the, the hot take there? Um, one thing that I think um, you know we see quite a bit of we have a we have a Kubernetes operator which will actually kind of in, get, get involved in the reconcile loop that comes with Kubernetes, um, and the Kubernetes operator actually uses the automation API inside it. it. Was one of the first things we built with the automation API. One thing that we're really seeing is like that convergence, right? Like that idea that your infrastructure converges. Like you know if you if you are using Kubernetes, you are used to this idea that it has this kind of self healing element to it, um, and and so we use our Kubernetes. We have multiple companies using our Kubernetes operator that are really just kind of looking for more um, more of that convergence, right? Like this, if you imagine running Pulumi in a far while loop or far or while loop, um, that's one really kind of thing that we're, we're kind of working on and looking at. Um, and I think that's, a, again, like marrying these two two kind of technologies together, I think is, is really, um, you know, such a really strong pattern um, that can allow you to not only only feel comfortable in the way you deliver infrastructure and applications. Um, it, it also makes you feel like your users just understand a little bit more what is going on in their infrastructure. And again, you know, I, the, this this has been an example of using Pulumi to kind of solve the problems that I talked about earlier. But if you don't want to use Pulumi, I would just implore you when you make this tooling decisions and when you decide how to do things within your organization, think about what the end users want. Like I have personally been one of those people who has just tried to shove this technology down people's, um, you know, down people's throats in, in some respect. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a much more invigorating and empowering way of working with your colleagues. If you just think about what they want and like, we are all here to help each other. And that's really what I want to talk like. This is why I love this slide, this cloud engineering for everyone. Like all of the big cloud providers and Kubernetes themselves have such a huge learning curve. There's such powerful pieces of technology and all the other cloud native uh, software. There's such powerful pieces of technology, but 
you have to be re- you have to remember that the you as a cloud native ambassador or you as a cloud native user you have time to kind of take these things in the people who are using them and consuming them don't always and if you think about how people want to consume these things i think it gets a lot more human that's absolutely it. I remember talking to developers and trying to explain to them uh, pod anti affinities, and they were like, "I don't, I don't care." Yeah, don't, like what? Like, can you just why make it work that... for me? Like, yeah, right. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So simplifying, uh, getting to the the kind of brass tacks, if you will, of what are we trying to do? I just need to ship this application. It needs to be somewhat redundant and uh, reliable. And providing that reliability is you you know, your job in a lot of cases, if you're an SRE engineer, or a DevOps engineer, platform, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, plenty of overloaded terms. Um, I have so many more questions, but we have kind of come to an end here. Um, yeah. One thing I'll highlight really quick that happened while we were chatting is that the KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2021 schedule has just released. Uh, so please check out Twitter or uh, the cncf.io website for more information on that. That event is in person and virtual. I will be there. I'm going early. Um, Lee, any final any final thoughts? No, I just I really appreciate the uh, the great questions that you asked. It's been a great experience. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube uh, later on today, uh, and you have any other questions, then just feel free to DM me at Brigzel, or you can talk directly to us at Palumi at Palumi Corp. Absolutely love it. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate you coming to Cloud Native Live, and uh, I think next week is going to be probably just as exciting as this week. So definitely tune in, uh, subscribe, and thank you so much for your time. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Thanks.